Welcome to Discover Iowa's Birds, Intro to Birding with Linda Rudolph. I'm Lori Neuerberg, she, her, hers, and I am a librarian at the University of Iowa Sciences Library. My colleague Conrad Ben Dixon is here behind the scenes to help you with any Zoom or technical questions that you might have. You can put those in the chat. If you would like to turn on live captioning, then you can do that. There is a button for it at the bottom of your screen. We will leave time for Q&A at the end of the program. There are resources to accompany Linda's talk at guides.lib.uiowa.edu slash birding, which includes a link to the Sciences Library's Kent Ornithology Collection. Also, it turns out that today is Draw a Picture of a Bird Day. You can post your drawing of a bird to the University of Iowa at Pentecrest Museum social media for a chance to win a gift card to a downtown Iowa City business. Thank you all for being here today. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Linda Rudolph. Linda Rudolph is a Coralville resident. She is a transplanted New Yorker who retired from the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics as an inpatient clinical pharmacist. Since retirement, she has become an active local birder. Linda currently serves in the Iowa Ornithologist Union as the Iowa Birds Listserv Co-Administrator. When she isn't hiking local areas, she enjoys international travel for bird watching. Linda has currently seen over 3,400 bird species. Thank you, Linda, for being here with us today, and I will let you get started. Well, thank you, Lori, for that kind introduction. Here, let me just get my PowerPoint started here. Welcome everybody um, to the enchanting world of birding. I'm delighted to give this talk today and to share my love and knowledge of bird watching. And I wish to thank Lori and the staff at the University of Iowa Sciences Library for this opportunity. Before we get started today, I do want to say that this isn't a comprehensive talk there are lots of resources I won't mention, and that's in the interest of time. The Sciences Library's webpage, as Lori says, has links and information about websites I will talk about today. In addition, Lori also mentioned this, but the Tom Kent um, collection of bird-related books and field guides is just really wonderful, and the collection might be of interest to many of you listening today. And as Lori said, I plan to leave time at the end of the talk for any questions that this might generate. I presume some of you are interested in bird watching, but just aren't sure about how to get started. Today, I'll talk about birding information sources and apps. I'll go over the gear to consider for a more enjoyable time in the field and strategies for going bird watching. I'll cover a little bit about participating in eBird and contributing to citizen science. I hope you will feel confident about stretching your birding wings and trying something new after today's talk. If you go to the Coralville Dam and look among the rocks on the dam face at this time of year, you will frequently see turkey vultures sunning themselves in the mornings with their wings stretched out like this turkey vulture is. The American Birding Association does have a birding code of ethics. It can be distilled into respecting wildlife, the environment, and the rights of others. And this next picture just illustrates uh, something. Since I'm a photographer, I was out um, at a cemetery one morning, quietly listening for winter birds. And I happened to look up and there was a barred eagle barred owl right over my head just on his daytime roost watching me and so I lifted my camera up to take a picture and I could tell that um, there was a branch going right across his face but I knew if I tried to um, move around and try to get a better angle for a, a branch free photo it would probably disturb the owl and make him fly off his daytime roost so I just quietly backed up and left him to his own devices. So um, 
just try to consider the welfare of birds when you're out bird watching. Um, roosting owls and nesting birds are two particular circumstances where we try not to disturb birds. Okay, let's just jump right in. This American white pelican was sitting on a rock very close to the bridge that goes over the Coralville Lowhead Dam. It's hard to miss a large stationary bird like this. Pelicans have an eight to nine foot wingspan. So even when they are flying, they are hard to miss. But many birds are small and quite active, like this yellow rumped warbler that I saw at Kent Park foraging in the snow. Other larger birds can be at a distance, like this soaring broad-winged hawk. And to see these birds, you really need a pair of binoculars. There are many choices for binoculars, and much of it is individual preference. If you Google birding binocular guide, well, there's several um, different sources for reviews that you could use. I just happened to pick the Audubon um, binocular review guide. And these are just um, three examples of binoculars, just so you have co something concrete to look at. So <clears throat> one beginning level budget binocular that Audubon would recommend would be the Nikon Pro Staff 3S 8x42s for $120. A good value binocular would be the Celestron Trail Seeker ED 8x42 for $300. And then a top end uh, binocular would be a Swarovski EL 8.5 times 42 for almost $3,000. You might notice the 8x42 after the binocular names. So 8 refers to the magnification of the object when you're looking through the binoculars. In other words, if you're looking at a bird, it'll be eight times um, with the binoculars. Um, obviously, you can have a lower power or a greater magnification. Um, if you have a lower power, well, then the bird isn't as clear in your field of view. If you have a greater magnification, let's say 50, well, it can actually be very hard to find the bird in your in your field of view just because you have no frame of reference because it's brought up so close and any handshake or wind or anything like that would make it just very difficult to, to actually see the bird so eight is a good compromise the 42 refers to the objective lens which is the large lens at the end of the binoculars and the larger that that lens is well, the clearer and the brighter the image is. Um, so obviously you could have a larger, a larger number or a smaller number. But um, the larger the number, the heavier the binoculars are. So again, you run into a problem with um, practicality. So eight by 42 is a um, good beginning binocular um, size. And it's actually the size that a lot of um, experienced birders use. If you can't find binoculars locally, there's an internet company I would suggest checking out, and that's redstartbirding.com. They um, specialize in birding related gear. Um, they take phone calls, they'll answer questions, and they have a good reputation in the birding world. This male yellow warbler is just singing his heart out. And what should you wear and bring with you for a morning of bird watching to try to see a bird like this? Well, I, I actually laid out a, a set of um, gear that I would wear and bring with me for a morning. In the upper top pen left corner, you can see that I have tall boots. They're ankle high and um, I strongly recommend boots like this, just because when you're bird watching, you have your eyes on the sky, on the branches, every place but where you're actually walking. And um, by having strong ankle support, you prevent quite a few ankle sprains. Then I have taller socks laid out and long pants. So 
especially if it's going to be ticker ticker season what i do is i get dressed and i put tuck the bottom of my pants into the top of my socks and then i spray uh, just a little bit around my boot openings my exposed socks and maybe the lower three inches of my pants with um, oh, 15 to 20 percent DEET. That I find really helps for me to prevent tick and chigger. And um, it's just something to be aware of. Another thing that um, a lot of people don't understand is that DEET can damage rubber, plastic, and vinyl. So you never want to apply um, it when you have your binoculars on your person. You do this with your binoculars safely far away and then carefully wash your hands after you apply DEET. I also, in addition to the long pants, I wear a long sleeve shirt. Um, they're both uh, lightweight and quick drying. They provide sun protection and protection from insect bites and thorns. And I just think it's a more comfortable way to be out in the field. I carry, have a water bottle laid out because I carry that with me. And then I have a hat. Um, one thing that's not apparent to many beginners is that you cannot effectively bird with sunglasses. The um, coating on the sunglasses affects the coloration of the bird feathers that you see. And so um, you need a hat with a visor really helps to provide um, for a more comfortable experience. I have my binoculars there and talking about the sun, you want to be sure to never point your binoculars at the sun and look at the sun with your binoculars. That's obviously would be quite dangerous. And then I know it's not aesthetically very nice, but I always carry a fanny pack with me. I have my phone with me and then you can have a nutrition bar and your car keys, whatever else you want with your fanny pack. Uh, I like this picture. So this ring-billed gull was floating over my head and you can see that he's got his neck cranked because he's watching me take his photo. So it's a pretty funny picture. And this is just a reminder and I'm just gonna go back because the birds are watching us while we're watching them. So one thing that birds uh, will often say is that you should wear muted colors in the field. So you, you can see that I've got like a sage green blouse and gray pants. You probably wouldn't want to wear fluorescent pink or something like that because it might, you might not see quite as many birds if you did. So in addition to binoculars and clothing, you probably need some reference resources so that if you see a bird, you'll know what bird you're seeing. And I happen to like uh, the Sibley Guide to Birds. I have both the printed copy and then they do sell an app for your phone. And so I have the app also. And I actually use the app quite a bit in the field. Um, I have a particularly hard time remembering bird songs. So I find myself out in the field and I hear a bird and I think, well, is that a Carolina wren? And you can type the bird in the app and, um, and then choose to listen to the song on the app. And then if you're hearing it in the field, you can compare the two. And it just helps reassure you that yes, that really was a Carolina Wren. <laughs> Let's say you go for a morning bird walk. And um, now I've mentioned morning several times. And that's because birds are most active from dawn to probably about 10 a.m. And then they take kind of a middle of the day siesta. And then they become more active around four or five until dusk. So um, the most effective birding is either in the morning or in the evening. And I happen to like mornings. But anyway, let's say we go out and we see an Eastern Towhee, a pretty Eastern Bluebird, a white-faced Ibis, and a beautiful Scarlet Tanager. Well, you've really had a good morning and seen a lot of fun birds. Um, but is there something more that you could do? And I would suggest that you participate in eBird. eBird is a free database run through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology 
and it's created by birders like you and me. Um, there's a website for your computer and a free phone app. eBird is your go-to place for participating in the largest citizen science project, for recording your findings, for keeping your bird list, for planning trips and places to go birding. eBird just offers a wealth of information. Um, it'll tell you where the local hotspots are, uh, Birders upload photos and audio so you can see what birds look like in your area and what they sound like, which can be quite different than what's illustrated in the field guide. Um, you can tell what birds are being seen and where. There are bar charts, so like there's a bar chart for Johnson County that I'll show you a little bit later on um, that tells you when birds are going to be here. There are maps, if you participate in eBird, and you upload checklists, well then there are maps of where you've, you have been birding and um, which species you've seen in which area. And it keeps your bird list. And I didn't understand why bird lists were important for a long time, but bird lists are actually can be quite a bit of fun. And you can create a list for your backyard, for Johnson County, for Iowa, for almost any area that you can think of. eBird does have very easy online guides on how to get started. It's used by hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. And um, so if you sign on to eBird.org, there's a help button. And if you press the help button, well, the online guides pop up and, and they're quite, quite helpful. Um, when I'm out in the field, I use my phone app um, and just enter start a checklist and start entering the birds that I see and hear. The first time you do it, it, it's going to be a little awkward. It might take two or three times, but really it doesn't take very long before it um, becomes quite natural. And um, I think if you gave it a chance, you'd enjoy using eBird. So when you use eBird, you're enter entering your sightings into a worldwide database. And the data is collated, and according to eBird, the data documents bird distribution, abundance, habitat use, and trends. And the data collected allows for citizen science. Well, in relation to birds, this citizen science um, becomes quite interesting. And I just uh, looked on the eBird website so that you could have a concrete example. They had an article about eBird data being used um, in relation to ozone pollution. Well, that stopped me right in my tracks because I thought ozone pollution, ozone's helpful. You know, you don't want that hole in the ozone layer. So I Googled that and I found a NASA website that just has an article called The Good, The Bad, and The Ozone. So it turns out that ozone in the upper atmosphere is good. It helps prevent radiation. But ozone down where we are in the lower atmosphere is bad and it causes respiratory trouble, both for people and for birds. So that's something that's monitored across the United States. And the scientists could use um, eBird data collated over years and and compare that to how much ozone pollution there is in different areas. And they estimated that um, as pollution goes down, well, you know, the birds do better. And 1.5 billion birds um, have been saved in the last 40 years just because we have decreased ozone pollution. So I've talked about the gear you might consider, birding resources, eBird, and citizen science. Now I'd like to cover some strategies a beginning birder can use to see birds. Just like this mallard duckling is out for one of his first exploratory swims, I hope this encourages you and gives you ideas for new birding experiences. The local Iowa City Bird Club is active and after COVID precautions are lifted, it will again start offering guided field trips. The website is iowacitybirdclub.org. 
And this is just a wonderful organization. Um, and I would highly recommend trying the field trips. So there's a schedule that's published of field trips on the website. And each field trip has a designated leader. Uh, there's a place and a time to meet. And um, when you meet up, the leader will take attendance and then everybody tries to carpool because it makes the field trip so much easier. So you'll all go someplace special that would have good birding and the leader will try to point out birds to everybody. It's a good way to meet other local birders, to go to hot spots where there are good birds that maybe you're not aware of. And if you're a beginning birder, I'm sure you'll see birds that you've never seen before or you maybe even heard of. The Iowa City Bird Club also offers beginning birder classes. And this spring they won't have them because of COVID, but they plan to resume them next spring. So that's another good opportunity for a beginning birder. They um, usually meet out at Kent Park and they have classes and they also do field trips. There's a statewide birding organization uh, called the Iowa Ornithologist Union. Its website is iowabirds.org. And this is just a wonderful organization. And the website is just full of useful information. And just in the interest of time, I just had to pick one thing that I thought was really important and help, could be helpful for a beginning birder. And that is the Iowa Bird mailing list. So the Iowa Bird mailing list is a free subscription service. You um, sign up for it and it's run through Google Groups. And what happens is, uh, let's say a birder is out in the morning and they see something really interesting. So they send an email into this mailing list and then the email is shared with everybody who signed up to participate. So it's a wonderful way to get to know where birds are being seen in Iowa. Um, you learn some of the other birders' names and you learn what birds are out and about. Um, so in the information for this web talk, there is a link for you to sign up. Also, if you just wanted to go to the iowabirds.org website, there's buttons across the top and you could press connect with others and then there's a drop down menu and Iowa Bird mailing list is one of the choices. And when you press that button, well then there's directions that would pop up on how to go about joining the mailing list. And I hope some of you consider doing that. It's a good resource for you. Bird watching is a hobby you can just do anywhere. But one strategy for a beginning birder would be to be observant of the birds you see in your normal day-to-day -day activities. There are interesting birds right here on the University of Iowa campus. Have you ever noticed bald eagles flying over, over campus or perched in trees along the Iowa River? Have you ever thought to yourself, what in the heck is going on with all those bald eagles? Well, of course, um, bald eagle is our national bird. And the pesticide DDT caused the shells of eagle eggs to thin and break. And by the 1950s, there were only about 412 nesting pairs of bald eagles in the lower 48 states. DDT was banned in the early 1970s, and eagles have just made a remarkable recovery. If you walk along the Iowa River in the winter, especially by a stretch of open water, the chances are you'll see a bald eagle. Um, what the eagles are doing is they're basically scavengers and they're watching for dead fish or fish that have been stunned by dams. And so then they swoop down and eat those fish. Um, many of these eagles have come down to winter in Iowa, but we have nesting bald eagles in all 99 counties in Iowa. And I can think of eight bald eagle nests in Johnson County. So I was thinking to myself, well, if I can think of eight nests in Johnson County, there's 99 counties in Iowa, just how many nesting bald eagles are there? Well, 
while I was developing this talk, a new article popped up in the eBird News section. And I didn't know this, but the United States Fish and Wildlife Service has been doing aerial surveys to track bald eagles. And this past year, the US Fish and Wildlife Service integrated their data from their aerial surveys with eBird data. And they estimate that there are now over 70,000 bald eagle nests in the lower 48 states, which is just amazing. And they think there's over 300,000 bald eagles in the lower 48 states. I think that's pretty awesome. So I don't know of a bald eagle nest right on the University of Iowa campus, but there's one not too far. This one is at the Iowa River Landing Wetland Park along the river behind the Marriott Hotel. Bald eagles tend to use the same nest year after year, and each year they add to the nest. So the nests are from four to 10 feet wide and two to eight feet high. And a large nest can weigh over 2,000 pounds, which it, so it needs a big tree. So consider watching for bald eagles as you hike across campus. Have you ever thought about the birds you see swooping through the air around campus buildings? One likely suspect is the tree swallow. These are a really pretty species with clean white underparts and iridescent blue-green upperparts. And one fun fact about tree swallows is that they can eat up to 5,000 insects a day when they are feeding nest nestlings. There are six species of swallows in Iowa, so it's fun to learn all their habits and differences. I think of birding as being like a treasure hunt. The more you know, the more likely you are to find your birding gems. There are many sycamore trees on campus. These two are located by the boathouse in front of the Mayflower dorm. So sycamore trees are usually large trees and they're the ones with the whitish branches up high. Well, it just so happens that yellow-throated warblers love sycamore trees. And you can look on eBird at the bar chart for Johnson County. So this is what a bar chart looks like. Um, the vertical axis are the bird species, and then the horizontal axis are the months of the year. And the green indicates when the bird has been sighted. And the thicker the green, well, then the more often birders are reporting that they're seeing that species. So yellow-throated warbler is the fifth from the bottom. And if you go across, you'll see that the green starts showing up in April and they leave in September. So they're here all year long, but they aren't reported all that frequently, just at a pretty steady rate. Um, then you could listen to the yellow-throated warbler song either on your Sibley phone app or on the Cornell Lab of Ornithology website. So knowing where the yellow-throated warblers like to be, what they sound like, and when they are here, it can be like a treasure hunt. Find the sycamore trees on campus, listen, and then if you hear one, look for them. Foraging in the tree, or if you're lucky, singing at the top of the tree. Another strategy for a beginning birder to use would be to go someplace that attracts birds, like the Kent Park Bird Blind. There are bird feeders set up in front of the blind and 62 species have been recorded there in eBird. The blind is located at the far end of the Conservation Education Center parking lot at Kent Park. It's a good place to go if you have mobility issues. There's a paved sidewalk to the door. And then once you open the door, it can be quite dark in the building. So I always leave my foot in the door until I reach the left and flip on the light switch. Once you get the light switch turned on, you'll see there's an array of chairs and comfortable benches to sit down on. Um, you, this is a good place to bring your, actually bring your printed field guide because you can sit it right next to you. And then when you sit down, you can pull the shutter that's in front of you 
you pull it down, well, then the bird feeders are arrayed in front of you. So the birds come very close. And if you're not very familiar with birds, you might be able to tell that this is a woodpecker. And you could look in your field guide and look at the woodpeckers and page through it until you saw that, oh, that's a red-headed woodpecker. So it's kind of a, an easy and fun way to learn your bird. And um, it's, it's just a nice experience. I think bird blind there is a lack of bird blinds. It's a wonderful place. I'm not sure I've ever gone to the Kent Park bird blind and not seen goldfinches. This is a male American goldfinch and he looks quite handsome in his black cap and black wings with um, white wing bars and bright lemony yellow feathers. And um, American goldfinches are Iowa State bird. So that's kind of fun. They're pretty common, but quite a few people don't know that um, females are just kind of a dull tannish color. And every fall, males molt so that they start looking like females. So this is what they turn into in the winter time. And um, this confuses people every year. Even if you've seen hundreds of goldfinches, it's always a good idea to take a good look at them. This goldfinch is missing his black cap. So it's really fun to see a bird with an aberrant feather pattern like this. One thing neat about goldfinches is that they're considered among the latest nesting Native American bird species. Birds generally tend to nest when they can assure themselves that they'll have a good food supply for their nestlings. And um, goldfinches like thistle seeds. So they wait until the thistles bloom and go to seed before they start nesting. Another strategy for a beginning birder to use is to go someplace people frequent so that birds are habituated to people and not quite as shy. Iowa City Park can have quite a few species. 111 have been recorded there in eBird and this beautiful wood duck was hanging around in 2016. It was fun to see him right out in the open like that. Another strategy um, for a beginning birder is to go someplace where there's good habitat for birds. And Hickory Hill Park in Iowa City is just an amazing woodland place. 185 species have been recorded there in eBird. Um, and birds like this sawwit owl. So northern sawwit owls only visit us in the winter. And this year there were a couple of owls that hung around the park for quite a bit. And one thing that's not apparent about from this photo is that these owls are smaller than a robin. So they're really teeny and it's fun to see them. Every spring, the Iowa City Bird Club hosts guided warbler walks at Hickory Hill Park. Now, this year they're not planning on having the guided walks because of COVID, but they'll resume next spring. And so, um, you know, there's a designated meeting place and a leader, and you just walk around the park with the leader and they try to identify birds that they're hearing and seeing. And you're quite likely to see an American Red Start when you go on these walks and quite a few other warblers too. It's a good opportunity for a beginning birder. In all, Johnson County has 92 hotspots listed in eBird. And a hotspot just tends to be a place that birders go to um, see birds. The top hotspots are Hawkeye Wildlife Management Area, the Terry Trueblood Recreation Area, Lake McBride State Park, the Coralville Lake, the dam area, and Kent Park. When you're out bird watching, you see other things because you're walking quietly and paying attention to what's around you. So that's another fun thing about bird watching. So here's two raccoon cubs. You see lots of chipmunks and tons of white-tailed deer. 
also out at the Hawkeye Wildlife Area, I frequently see Blanding's turtle, which is a threatened species in Iowa. So it's really fun to see them. Um, I like the ephemeral spring woodland flowers like Dutchman's breeches, Virginia bluebell, bellwort, and trout lily. And then the other thing is that birding binoculars can be used to look at butterflies. So um, butterflying is quite fun. Uh, one thing about butterflies is that they're often good when birding is bad. So you go butterflying after 9 a.m. on a hot sunny day, often in June or July, when um, birding tends to be not very good. So this is a monarch nectaring on red clover. And here's an eastern comma pretty early in the spring before there's any um, leaves out. And I just had to include this one because this is one of my favorite Iowa butterflies. This is a bronze copper. They're pretty small. You tend to see them on dikes around ponds. And um, if you look closely, you might be able to see that he has black and white stripes on his antenna. I just think that makes him very endearing. This wild turkey is strutting right in a local neighborhood. <laughs> so pretty fun. So part of what makes birding so much fun is that you can do it anywhere, from sitting at home watching your bird feeders, to walking a cramp across campus, to when you travel. And I actually like to travel to go bird watching. There are companies that specialize in bird watching tours, both in the US and internationally. Many countries have their own field guides and um, the Tom Kent collection at the Sciences Library has quite a few field guides from other countries and they're fun to look at. And you can eat bird anywhere you go. So this is what our belted kingfisher looks like in Iowa. They're quite a handsome bird. They've got a steel gray top and some white accents. But this is a kingfisher from Asia. These are widespread, white-throated kingfisher. And it's just a handsome bird with that honking big red bill, the rusty head and chest, and then the brilliant blue, electric blue back and tail. We have one hummingbird in Iowa, the ruby-throated hummingbird. They're really cute. But there are over 300 species of hummingbirds in um, Central and South America. So um, hummingbirds like this white-necked Jacobin, which are just a, a handsome hummingbird. This is a white-bellied wood star. Um, they're about the size of a ruby-throated hummingbird. But the fun thing about these little hummingbirds is that they're like bumblebees. They really kind of bumble around when they fly. And so they're pretty endearing. And then this little guy is about an inch smaller than our ruby-throated hummingbird. This is a rufous-crested coquette. So he's got quite a bit going on for such a little teeny guy, especially his, um, the rufous head feathers are really neat. And each, each feather's tipped with a little black, makes it fun. I mentioned the scarlet tanager earlier. Well, there's a whole family of tanagers in Central and South America that's not related to our tanagers at all. And many of them are brilliantly colored and um, they form large feeding flocks, so it can be a lot of fun. Um, this is a green-headed tanager that I saw in Brazil. And this is a golden chevron tanager in Brazil. And you can just see there's uh, lots of different colors. We don't have any native parrots in Iowa, and um, parrots are, are fun birds. This is a Port Lincoln parrot from Australia, and he's eating flowers. And this is another Australian parrot. This is an Australian king parrot, and they're quite handsome with their green and red. And this is a blue and yellow macaw from Guyana, and it's just amazing to see these large birds flying in flocks across the jungle. 
This is a stellar sea eagle, and it was quite an experience to see these birds. Uh, we went to Japan in the winter time, and you go up to the northernmost uh, Japanese island, which is Hokkaido, and in the northern part of Hokkaido, and um, you, you go out onto the uh, in a boat to the pack ice in the Pacific Ocean, and then they actually um, chum the stellar sea eagles. They throw out fish. So stellar sea eagles are closely related to bald eagles, but they're like a bald eagle on steroids. They're bigger, their bills are bigger, their claws are bigger, and they do scavenge like um, bald eagles, but they also actively hunt prey. So they're different in that way. And it was just a fun experience to get to see them. So he's actually sitting on a little ice floe. Um, and of course, you see animals when you travel. So this is a common linger, a lion in Botswana by a water hole. And I just included one plant flower, one plant picture, but there's um, interesting plants wherever you go. This is kangaroo paw in Australia. And then you have fun, exam um, fun experiences when you travel. So uh, this is in Botswana, and we did what they call hop turnarounds. We flew uh, to grass runway strips on these little like 10 passenger planes, and they kept the propeller and the engine going the whole time. So you just quickly get off the plane, they take your luggage out and a little bit of food for you, and there's two um, vehicles to meet you, and there's nothing else at this runway. There's no mechanic or anything like that. So they keep their propeller going. So they feel like this ensures that the plane will actually be able to take off again. Uh, and this is another fun experience we had in Brazil. Uh, the guy with the oar is a young Brazilian ornithologist named Marcio Repinin. And he took us across this pretty fast flowing river and what looked to me like a homemade boat. It wasn't too seaworthy. And we hiked up a hill and we saw his special birds that he's studying, which is um, Tropero seed eater. Uh, the interesting thing about these Tropero seed eaters is that they don't, they know where they nest and we saw nesting seed eaters, but they have no idea where they disperse to after they nest. So there's still lots to figure out about in the birding world. And then, of course, there's butterflies across the world, too. This is a common blue bottle in Cambodia and a periander metal mark from Ecuador. And there are snakes and other interesting things. I didn't include any other photos. I didn't want to um, upset anybody, but this is a South American rattlesnake. I thought they were were quite handsome. We saw uh, uh, two or three of them and uh, we got to watch this one climb up a bush and then settle in the a crook of a branch. And of course when you're on a birding trip you, you're with other people that are interested in birding. So here we are in front of the Taj Mahal. We uh, went in, saw the building, and then we birded on the grounds. So in all there have been 336 bird species documented in Johnson County in eBird. And I hope this talk has given you some new tools and ideas about how to go out and see some of our feathered friends. And um, I'm happy to take any questions that you have at this time. Thank you, Linda, for that wonderful talk. I love seeing all those beautiful pictures of birds. Your photography is amazing. It looks like we have a comment in the Q&A and feel free to put your questions in the Q&A and we'll answer as many questions as we have time to do. So first our comment uh, from Daniel, we did the eBird February Backyard Feeder Count. Their app for reporting our counts was very easy to use. And at the end of the count, they got a nice report of their count. So someone else has used the eBird feeder count and really liked it. 
And we have another question. What is your favorite bird? And this oh is from my. Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you could pick up a, a favorite bird. Um, I'm very fond of Eastern bluebirds. For many years, I helped with the um, Iowa Songbird Project and maintained two bluebird trails. And it hasn't been possible for the last few years, but they're, they're pretty good birds. They, they're nice. That's great. Uh, we have a comment here and a question. I, it's from Kathy. I saw a movie a few years ago with Steve Martin, I think, about competitive bird watching. Is that really a thing? Oh, yes. Actually, the book is much better than the movie. There's a book um, that the movie came from, and the book's actually a good read. Um, competitive bird watching is quite, quite the deal. I'm not a competitive person, so don't, I don't engage in it. But we have um, people who um, there's actually a, a few people who live in Iowa City that if there's a rare bird reported in the United States, they'll actually fly to go see just that one bird, um, you know, and add it to their bird list. Uh, even in Iowa, people compete um, to how many birds can they see in Johnson County in a year or Iowa in a year or something like that. It's, it's, it can be quite fun. That sounds interesting. I didn't know about competitive bird watching. So thank you for bringing that up, Kathy. We have a question from Leo about how many species of owls reside in Iowa and what's your favorite owl? Oh my, I'd have to think about it. We have great horned owls, barred owls, um, long-eared owls, short-eared owls, uh, rarely burrowing owls, the northern sawwood owl and snowy owls, uh, screech owl. <laughs> I think that might be Z8, something like that. So um, I like those northern sawwood owls. They're really cute. Okay, we have another question from Mark. I had rusty blackbirds this winter for the first time and have thought maybe I've seen them from a distance lately. Do they stay here year round? Uh, I don't know, I don't think so. I'm not 100% sure. Rusty blackbirds is an interesting um, species. It used to be that they were quite prevalent and um, you, you could see huge flocks of 1,000, 2,000 rusty blackbirds. And their population has just crashed. And so there's quite a bit of concern about rusty blackbirds. And they've been doing more studying and trying to figure out how they can support the population. So it's really good that he got to see some. Our next question is from Sarah. What is the most common owl in central Iowa City neighborhoods? Barred owl. And we have another great question from Kathy. Did the derecho last year have any sort of negative impact on bird populations to your knowledge? Um, there is some thought that it will affect um, the population of birds. They aren't sure, but it just makes sense if you, especially in Cedar Rapids and places like that, if you take out so much of the tree canopy, well, you would think some of the woodland species would have trouble. We have a question here from Don. It seems like there is a red-winged blackbird on every fence post when you drive through rural Iowa. Are they guarding their territory? That's a good Absolutely. question. That's a great question. And so that's the male that you're probably seeing, the one with the red wing patches. And he's singing his song, proclaiming that that's his territory. And um, Lori had a great uh, audio before this began with red wing blackbirds on it. And then the female is just a, a much quieter, 
colored. She's um, kind of a dark brown with a little bit of white, whitish stripes on her. But um, so she's a uh, much, you know, quieter than he is. We have a question from Linda. It's a really good question. What kind of camera do you recommend? Oh, <laughs> so that's a complicated question. Uh, over the years, I've certainly used uh, different models, but I like Canon. I think there's a lot of thought among bird watchers that Canon uh, does provide for a good birding camera. It can be quick. And um, I usually use a 100 to 400 lens. There's two iterations and the second um, model is the better one, the 100 to 402. Uh, I, have a Canon 7 Mark, what is it, Canon 7D Mark II is what it is. Um, and I also have a Tamron 150 to 600 lens. So I'm using a zoom lens when I take those bird photos. And um, camera photography is easy for some people. Uh, I've struggled to learn, but it's so much fun when you get a good photo. That's really interesting. I'm glad you use the zoom lens because the lion looked very close. <laughs> I thought about that. We have another question from Catherine. Were there, were there more birds during um, quarantine when most people were stuck inside? Were there more birds out because people are inside? Well, you, you kind of wonder about that, don't you? Um, you know, people do tend to bother birds and it's one of the part of the uh, American Birding Association Code of Ethics uh, where you, you try not to bother nesting birds and roosting owls and things like that. So you have to think about it. We have a question, another question from Leo. We thought we saw a Merlin in our tree. Are they common around Iowa City? Oh, Leo, that's a great sighting. Um, no, they are not common, but it wasn't too many years ago that there was documented a documented nesting pair of Merlins in Iowa City that hadn't happened for many years. And um, so that's kind of exciting if you're seeing them, you may have nesting Merlins in your neighborhood. We have a question and comment from Carolyn. She's watching from Minneapolis. She has a heron rookery on two small islands in the Mississippi nearby. They all just settled in and they're refurbishing the nest from years past and some are laying eggs. Do you know how long the gestation is and how long they'll be around? Also this year, many cormorants have joined in. Might they push the herons out eventually? Um. I don't know the answer to, for sure to any of those questions. Uh, you know, I do know that there are often mixed rookeries. So I've seen rookeries where there's egrets and herons and cormorants and they're all nesting together. So I hope the cormorants don't push the herons off their rookery, but I don't know. Um, that's a great question. We have a question from Melissa. What is your favorite place in the world to see birds? Um, I, you know, New Zealand was maybe uh, the most astonishing trip I've taken. We did um, five boat trips where you go out in the ocean and you see albatrosses and seabirds. And there is no other place in the world like New Zealand for seeing seabirds. And the scenery is awesome. Uh, it's just, it's a country that uh, there's no other place like it in the world. It's great presentation and fabulous photos. What is the one mistake that beginning birders make and how can we avoid making this mistake? Oh, I'm not sure there is a mistake. Um, birding should be fun. It's, it's a, uh, hobby where you're continually learning and you can enjoy almost any experience you have with birding. So I'm not sure there's a mistake, 
maybe not going out at the right time of day or thinking the middle of summer is the best time to go birding. That's neither one of those things is true. Uh, it's better to go in the morning or the evening and spring and fall are your best birding times. What sure. happened to the birds in Cedar Rapids during the 141 mile per hour Dorito winds? You know, they don't know what happened. Uh, I think probably quite a few of them were harmed. Uh, it just makes sense. There was just so much damage. Uh, those little birds have a hard time surviving something like that. It was in August, so most of the nesting was done, which is a good thing. And, um, you know, I don't think there's any definitive answer. I have a question for you, which is, how did you get started with birding? Is it something that you did when you were young as a child, or did you start as an adult? That's a good question. Um, I think I've always been interested in birds. Uh, even um, when I was in college, I happened to take ornithology, and I worked at a summer camp with a director who, he's quite elderly at the time, so this is many years ago, he was one of the original board members of Audubon. So he had a great interest in birds, and I think that encouraged me that, oh, you can do this as a hobby. Well, I think that's all of our questions. Thank you, Linda, for sharing all of your birding experience and knowledge with us today. And thank you to my colleagues from the Sciences Library and thank you to the audience for coming today. There is a survey that you can fill out to give us feedback after you leave the webinar. And just a reminder, the resources to accompany this talk are available at guides.lib.uiowa.edu slash birding. And we appreciate you all coming out and spending time with us today. And we hope to see you at more University of Iowa Science Library events soon. So thank you all. Thank you.